Some of you are new to us tonight. This is your first one for, to uh, Secret Church, and we want you to know that we're glad that you're here. But those of you who have been here, this is our fourth week, and I want us to review just a little bit. So, Ronnie, go ahead and take us through this review. Let's go to the next one here. We recognize that there's persecuted church all around the world, increasingly persecuted church all around the world. And this persecution causes these people to often gather in hiding and gather in difficulty. And when they get together, they intensely study the Bible. And so that's part of our, our motivation to deeply look and to go fast and to look at much um, in this time. So we're going to move very fast tonight as we have been. And uh, we're looking at this subject of cults and counterfeit gospels so incredibly prevalent all around us that we don't realize. If you're good old Betty Baptist or Betty Bob or something like that, and you've been here forever, um, you may not realize how much the cults are around us. And there's people that are in this room that say, actually, I came out of some of the cults that we're studying, or I was affected by this. Um, I can tell you that there's Baptist life that it it may not be considered a cult or a counterfeit gospel, but it may be cultural Christianity, cultural Christianity that does not hold on to the gospel. And so um, before we point too many fingers all around, we need to constantly even look at our own house and make sure that we know the gospel, that we believe the gospel, that we're living the gospel. And that's what these sessions are about, to help you be very familiar with the gospel. So our first week, we looked at the one true gospel. And notice these things that we noticed on that. Let's read them out loud together. Number one, the character of God. Holy, just, and loving. We, we looked at this. Other things we can say about the character of God, but the character of God is an important part of the gospel. Number two, the sinfulness of man. Number three, the sufficiency of Christ, that Christ is totally sufficient. You don't have to add anything to what Jesus did in order to save us. That's what we mean by that. He's completely sufficient. You cannot add anything for your salvation. Look at number four. The necessity of faith. Jesus says without faith, it's in, or the Hebrew writer says without faith, it is impossible to please God. God loves it when we trust him. And this is what he is after, that you and that I would truly trust him. And then number five, let's read it out loud. What is number five? The the urgency of eternity. What does that mean? That means eternity is coming and every single person is going to be in eternity in a very short amount of time. You say, do you know something I don't know? I just know human history. No one makes it off this dirt ball alive without Christ. That is the picture of our need for salvation in Christ. And the eternal state is coming very quickly. And so let's look at the next one. Week two was the one, not just the one true gospel, but then the one true God. And we looked at three things that were very important. First of all, the Trinity, the issue of the Trinity. And what is the Trinity? The Trinity is number one, God in three persons. Number two, each person of God is what? Fully God, not partially God, fully God, always eternally fully God. And number three, there is one God. So three in one, this is the nature of our creating God. This is the nature of who he is. If anybody can fully explain it to you, run the other direction because they will deceive you. This is, this is the essence of God. He is beyond our capacity to fully and completely understand in every way. I know that we're going to be looking at a lot of texts tonight. Some of them are lightly printed. So I'm going to ask Michael if you would turn on the single, where it says the single fluorescent lights up there. He's going to flip these on so that you can see it a little bit easier. Now, look at the next one. Last week, we studied identifying the cults and the counterfeit gospels. Now, notice these and uh, just notice these few statements. There's three statements that we're going to say. What is a cult? And look what it says. And um, I'm going to ask Curry. Curry, will you read that real loud for me? Okay. So these are the groups that claim that they're Christians but then they deny key things. They deny salvifically important. That means save of things of salvational importance. They deny key doctrines. And that's what a cult does. It will say, oh yeah, we're Christian, but then they will deny something and what they deny 
can very easily take you to hell by not believing it. So this is, this is part of the issue of misunderstanding the gospel. This is part of the issue of not seeing it. Look at the next part here. Um, generally, they follow the instruction of one individual who dictates false teaching. So one of the things that is so characteristic of cults is that it kind of goes back to one individual. Not always. There are some cults that are a, multiple, um, a, multi a group of people that have deceived them. But most of the time, it can be traced back to one man or one woman. Not always a man. Sometimes a woman. Um, and so this is, we're, we're going to see this is very important. And these are important things. Even, even this tonight, as we start to look at Mormonism, you're going to see why that's such a big deal. And you're going to see why this is such a concern and how this even fits in. Look at the third statement that we said last week. The counterfeit gospel is a fraudulent imitation of the gospel. And what does it do? It deceives. It comes in and causes you not to believe the right thing. So tonight, if you would, um, let's go ahead and get on the same page together and turn over um, to page 37. If you're not already there, go to page 37. Now, part of this thing of looking at counterfeits has been, we've talked about the fact that um, the reason we studied the, the, the one true gospel and the one true God and really looked at that is that you need to know the real thing before you can identify the, the false thing. And um, I'm just going to do this right now. I'm going to pass around two $100 bills and um, one of them is real and one of them isn't real. And you can just take a couple of minutes and look at them. Now, Scott, I expect to get these back. So um, I don't want to get two fake ones back. Um, one of them needs to be the real deal as it comes back. But we, we uh, somebody, somebody who works at Publix, um, someone passed this to them expecting for it to go. And the young lady, Jessica Loudon, who works at Publix, was there at the cashier. And she took it and she goes, and she said the first thing that it was, was she felt it. And even though you're going to see, it feels very, it feels very good. It is a, it is a very um, obvious, but yet, it's a, they, they, were, they made it to pass it as real. Um, but I don't know if you noticed, does one of them say, do you see what it says? Good for what? Good for motion picture use only is what it says. So um, it's just kind of funny, you know, but, but um, you can see it. So um, we have to know the truth um, in order to be able to identify the falsehood. And so tonight we want to look at this. Uh, this is an important message for us. Who are the Mormons? We're going to move very fast and get ready to fill in. Warm up your pen here and let's go. Known as the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints or fill it in LDS. LDS. So some of these I've left filled in and they have a little bit of space both, both before and after the word. So that doesn't necessarily mean another blank on some of these, but the Latter day Saints. And you see them all around. You will see uh, uh, them as you drive through towns. You will see um, churches that, that show that. Sometimes they have the most beautiful commercials on television and things that we at first think are Christian. And then we see at the end LDS or the Church of Latter day Saints. So these are members of New Testament, excuse me, the, the idea here is members of the New Testament church were saints. We, the reason that they call themselves um, the Latter-day Saints is because that is the, what the, we see true in Scripture. So the next two passages here, Acts chapter 9 and Ephesians chapter 2, call Christian saints. These are not, saints are not um, voted on by the Catholic Church and then become a saint. It's not that they have to perform a miracle. The Catholic Church will teach that. But you guys, basic Christian doctrine says if you are a Christian, you have been blood washed clean by the Lord Jesus Christ and you have been made a saint in him. And that's another, that's a whole beautiful picture of who we are truly in Christ. You say, wow, I didn't realize I'm called a saint. Yes, but that's, that's where they get this from. And that's where it makes it into their name. Just the interesting thing is it says latter day saints as opposed to the former day saints. And we'll see that in just a moment. But these are the, the saints as of late, as opposed to the early early saints, the former saints of the apostles. So um, notice this, the next bulletin there. Total apostasy overcame the church following who? 
the apostles. So notice this. Total, what, what they claim is that the church completely fell apart 2,000 years ago and that the, that the true church was lost after the apostles. So, but come along in 1830 over in America, the Mormon church claims to be the restored church. So this is what they would say, and we're, we're going to see where they get this from. And this is all based upon, the next part here, based upon the teachings of one man named Joseph Smith. And he was the first president and prophet of the LDS, or the Latter-day Saints. He was born in rural Vermont in 1805, so this was a couple hundred years ago. Then they moved with family to New York. Most of the family became Presbyterians. He personally leaned toward the Methodism and he was bothered by the fact that there were different, there were Baptists and Methodists and Presbyterians, and he was so bothered by that that at a camp meeting one time, he, he was praying to God, and he was reading from James 1, and he was saying, Lord, give me wisdom about, if anyone asks of God, you will give wisdom, and so tell me which one of these is correct. And so at that point, he had, as he was praying for that, he claimed 14, excuse me, his first vision at age 14 of two personages that would come to him, two beings that would come to him. God the Father pointed to Jesus and said, and notice the dialogue that is here, this is my son, hear him. You say, okay, well, that's kind of, that doesn't sound too far off from some things in the New Testament. And then Smith asked, which sect should I join? Now he's talking about Presbyterian, Methodist, Baptist, you know, which one? Anglican, which one? And the, he says that the, the father said, none, they are all wrong. So this was his, this was his supposed vision that he had. Now, another vision of the angel, Moroni, who stood, who told him of golden plates written in hieroglyphics. Smith translated the writings with two reading crystals, and later those became what is called the Book of Mormon. So all of this comes around, um, a guy who started supposedly when he was 14, having one of many visions, and those visions began to show him supposedly, that this was the lost heritage. So the Book of Mormon contains, and here it is at the top of the page on page 38, this contains the story of lost Israelites who migrated to America in the 6th century B.C., so 600 years before Christ, and were killed in battle A.D. 428. So... That's, that was his initial beginning big story. Look at the next part. Another vision from John the Baptist. So he says that John the Baptist came to him and appeared to him, made Smith a priest. So here he's claiming a priesthood. And in 1830, Smith founded the Church of Christ, later known as the Church of Jesus Christ of, again, what does it say? Latter-day Saints. Those are the later saints as opposed to the early saints. So you got the difference here. This is where they're coming from. The idea of the early saints that had, that had wound up becoming apostate and they become the later saints. So Smith continued to receive revelations. Fill that in. Revelations telling him to move from New York to Ohio, to Missouri, and eventually to Illinois, where the founder and his followers built the town of Nuvu. Um, at Nuvu, or Nuvu, um, they tried to live in a utopian vision of society. He was the controller there, and he instituted polygyny, or the idea of having more than one wife, not polygamy, but polygyny. And then, Early Mormon leaders believed Jesus had many wives. That's the, that's the idea that he was promoting. Jesus had many wives. And Mary, Mar you know, we see these that are around him. Mary Magdalene and, and the others. Jesus had many wives, supposedly, in his view. You see, so already there's major distortions going on. Now, you remember when we studied Jude, 
And when we've looked at other passages in the New Testament, that some of the distortions of apostate false leaders, one of the reasons that they do, you, let's remember, what are some of the reasons that false leaders rise up in the church? We see this in James, we see it in um, Jude, and we see it even in Titus. What are some reasons? False leaders, why do they rise up? Personal gain. So maybe for wherever she is, I just heard her. Personal gain, money, or something along those lines. What else? What other personal gain might they have? Power. So they're influencing, controlling people. What else? Greed. Y'all are afraid to say it. Greed. Okay, that's kind of the, the gain, the, the personal gain of, of money. Yes. Y'all are being nice and gentle. S-E-X. Sex. I mean, that is one of the things that we see listed in Jude. That pastors or evangelists or prophets or whatever, they come along and everybody kind of really knows what they're doing on the side too. And it's in this power thing that, that, that they do that. And I mean, some of them are super overt about it, like David Koresh. David Koresh had all of these women that he was involved with. And some of them, it's not just women, but it's women and men. I mean, so we, we, you see these throughout history that come along. Jesus warned us that this would happen, that for personal gain, people would come preaching the gospel. And here we see it right at the start. I mean, he is talking about um, polygyny. And then notice this, Smith and his brother were arrested in 1844. Later, a mob stormed the jail and killed them both. Mormons consider Smith a martyr. Others say Smith died in a violent shootout. And so this is the picture that there's, um, there's big story, there's um, sexual motivation in it, and there's other things. This is, by the way, very clearly in secular history, and some of it is clearly in Mormon history. Um, so both um, corroborate um, this account. Look at the next part here. There's a schism or a, a divide after Smith's death. A small group of Josephites beca became the reorganized church with headquarters in Missouri. Most followed a man named Brigham Young as their first president and prophet who took followers to Utah in 1847 and built what city? Salt Lake City. So this is, they, they went out to Salt Lake City and from scratch, they built what was a stop in the road. They built Salt Lake City. Um, and that today, of course, has um, uh, a very high concentration of Mormons in it even today. So today, what is the size of this cult? Today, there are over 16 million members, 16 million members um, in 30,000 congregations worldwide. 9 million members in America, and so additional 7 million outside of the United States, so they are worldwide in their, in their press and in their scope. Look at the next part, 70,000 missionaries around the world. Many of you have seen them, they're missionaries locally. You see them in their white shirts and very often on a bicycle. Um, they typically have a name tag on. Um, everybody kind of knows it. Everybody kind of identifies it. If you are growing up in a Mormon, um, Mormon home, it is expected that you're going to do a two-year mission. Um, and so there's, we, we see that both here and we see it around the world. Mormons in the United States, let's look at this. Mormons in the United States, bottom of page 38, are, here's the commitment among morning, Mormons. 67% are highly involved in their congregations. 67%. Compare with 43% among evangelical Protestants. So the Gallup um, group did an in-depth study um, along with the Pew Foundation, and they really looked at, at involvement of all kinds of religious groups in the United States, and that's where some of these numbers come from. 91% um, believe the Bible is the word of God. So they have a high group, a high percentage of people who believe that. 85% pray daily. 85% pray daily. 84% say religion is very important to their lives. 77% read scripture regularly. Now let me tell you, when it comes to those disciplines, the Mormons spank us. And, and what you're going to see tonight is that that is a tragedy. 
Because very often, they are very disciplined about some things that are very sad and very concerning. Look at the next part here. From 2007 to 2014, the number of Mormons in the United States remained roughly the same. So for a seven-year period, there was not a great change in the number of Mormons. In the same time period, the number of people who identify as Christian dropped by 8%. So while cultural Christianity is, is crashing and falling down, which I'm not all that sad about because I, I believe that cultural Christianity isn't what's going to save you. Cultural Christianity will take you merrily to hell. It will deceive you straight into hell, land you safely in the lake of fire. And I, I just, I think that it's really important that we recognize that the Mormons in their deception have remained very ardent. Now circle the next part. Claims by Mormons, that, that phrase. I want you to see these claims. They say that 97% say Mormonism is a Christian religion. Um, they would say, we are Christian. That's what they would say. 97% of people who are Mormons say that. In fact, if you were to say, well, wait a minute, you're really part of a cult. A lot of them have heard that before. A lot of them have heard someone say that but they still can be really hurt by that. They can be really offended by that, that you're just calling them a cult. You're, they would say, no, we just, we have the true gospel and you don't. And then you can say, well, like I said, um, you're part of an exclusivist claim to, the, to this, which is not of basic orthodoxy based upon the scripture. So, but they would say, I'm part of the Christian religion. Next bullet point there, 94% believe that the president of the LDS church is a prophet of God. So they would say, this guy is a prophet. This guy who is elected by other people is a prophet. Look at the next one. 91% believe that the Book of Mormon was written by ancient prophets. So uh, the Book of Mormon it was eventually translated, supposedly, using um, these crystals and that this was actually from ancient prophets. 95% believe that families can be bound together eternally in temple ceremonies. So the idea is when you see the temple out by I-75 and the, some of the special ceremonies that go on there in marriage, if you go to the temple and you're married in that setting, that you are eternally bound to your spouse. Um, that's, uh, that's playing on the desire to, to have these earthly relationships to become permanent relationships in, in, um, in heaven. Look at the next part here. 94% believe that God the Father and Jesus Christ are, fill it in, separate beings. They are separate physical beings. Now, right out there to the side, huge. And put an exclamation point. This is a big deal. This is a big issue that they would deny that the Father and the Son are one, that they are separate beings. So that brings us into this thing of not just who they are and where they are and where they came from, but now we want to spend most of our time looking at, well, what do they actually believe? And so these are um, important for us, so we're going to spend the next little bit working on what do they actually believe, and I hope that you're able to identify some of these things. Now, Notice this, where it says exclusive claims. Now, to be, sure, to be honest and to be sure, we have exclusive claims. I believe in something called the exclusivity of the gospel. But I believe in the exclusivity of the gospel based upon the New and Old Testament that have stood in, in seasoned proclamation of the truth for 2,000 years of the New Testament. And so I don't believe anything new out of the New Testament. I, I, I believe in the doctrines of the New Testament as presented in the first century without change. And so, you know, whenever you see something that's new that comes along, even if you study them later and you're, and you're looking at, well, this was a new doctrine, this was the original doctrine, if there's something that comes along that's new, that should immediately cause you to go, hmm, why have I never heard this before? Why is this, why is this like this? And, and as you begin to look at it, and if you can, through research, begin to show, no, this is a new belief. This was not believed before, then we can, we can pretty much rest assured that there is something gone 
wrong. Um, so notice this statement and notice in circle at the very bottom of this paragraph where it says LDS.org. And by the way, LDS.org is actually the official Latter-day Saint website. This isn't a 15-year-old that has been maintaining a website for Mormons. This is their actual official website. So Baptists don't have, quote-unquote, an official website. There's all kinds of different Baptists. Christians don't necessarily have an official website. There's all kinds of different Christians. But that's not true among the Mormons. The Mormons have a specific thing that is sanctioned, that is official, based upon, um, that basically comes down from the president and his council um, for the Mormon church and the Mormon religion. So notice what it says here. The gospel of Jesus Christ was lost from the earth through the apostasy that took place following the earthly ministry of Christ's apostles. That apostasy made necessary the restoration of the gospel. Through visions, the ministering of angels, the revelations to men on earth, God restored the gospel. The restoration started with the prophet Joseph Smith, and then they're starting to quote some of those sources here for you, for you to go back and look at, and has continued to the present through the work of the Lord's living prophets. And so the, the idea is the prophets continue, the president is the prophet um, that is alive for them. Now, if you believe this paragraph, you are wiping out 1,700 years of Christian doctrine. If you believe that when Joseph Smith came along and he presented these truths as truth, what you're saying is, well, when Joseph Smith came along, there's 1,700 years of Christian theology that is to be thrown out because it is a radically different doctrine. And we're going to see what those radically different doctrines are. You'll see it. General categories. First of all, there's traditional Mormons that believe the LDS, has, what the LDS has always taught. There are progressive Mormons, follow some of the diverse voices within Mormonism. So there's, there's shifts that happen within the, within the um, cult. But look at the next one here. The majority of Mormons, including many Mormon missionaries and Mormon church leaders, here, here's the deal, they are not well versed in the specifics of Mormon theology. Now, before you turn the page, just kind of think about this. What this is saying is there's a lot of Mormons who don't really know what they believe. Aren't there a lot of Christians who don't really know what they believe? Aren't there a lot of Baptists who if you go up to them and say, why are you Baptist? And they would go, because my grandfather was a Baptist. Or it's because they got the best breakfast for whatever. Or, you know, there's, there's something else. I mean, there, there's, well, I like their building, or I like their nursery, or they, you know, consumer Christianity, where we just kind of go for whatever is for us. People don't really know the doctrine. Now, our church is trying to stand against that. Our church is trying to say, no, what you believe really matters. It's not just how you look and feel and smell. It, what really matters is what you think and what you believe. And so, there are many Mormons who really don't know. You're going to know more about Mormonism than a fair amount of Mormons at the end of this tonight, especially when it comes to the specific mechanics of what they believe and what they don't believe. And so just, just understand that. Let's look and see what they believe about God. And so put a big square around the words about God up there at the top of page 40. So put a nice square around that. And so you can kind of see, okay, now we're looking at what they think about God. Here's what they think about God. God the Father was once a man and has now progressed to Godhood. So it starts off with being man and progressing to Godhood. And Lorenzo Snow said this, As man now is, God once was. As God now is, man may become. Now, doesn't this kind of go back to the Garden of Eden? That you can be God. You can be, you know, the, the whole picture is you can be like him. You can be, you can be him. Look at the next part. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are three distinct gods. They believe that the, God the Father is a God, God the Son is a God, and God the Holy Spirit is a God. 
Notice what they believe about God the Father. God the Father is the physical father of all spirit children, which includes all people as well as Jesus and the Holy Spirit. So there's this number one God who was, began as a man, and then he becomes God, and now he is begetting God the Son and begetting God the Holy Spirit as different gods. And notice this. I want you to read this paragraph that's here. There are three separate persons in the Godhead. God, the Eternal Father, His Son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Ghost. We believe in each of them. And here's part of their Articles of Faith. That's what A of F stands for, and we'll see that in just a minute. Articles of Faith 1-1. So they start off saying there's God the Father, Jesus Christ, His Son, and the Holy Ghost. Notice the next part. From Latter-day Revelation, so that's from Joseph Smith in the 1830s, from Latter-day Revelation, we learn that the Father and the Son have tangible bodies of flesh and bone, and that the Holy Spirit is a personage of spirit without flesh and bone. Again, that's coming from the Doctrine and Covenants, the D&C. These three persons are one in perfect unity and harmony of purpose and sound doctrine. And then notice here, they quote John 17, but also second, and that there's other books that they're quoting here, including, we see here at the finally end, we're getting this from the LDS.org. Now, what we start to see is they're taking bits of truth and then turning it. And that's what cults do. Look at the next part. The bottom line is that Mormons believe that thousands of gods exist. Thousands of gods exist. Notice the next statement that's here. Latter-day Saints see all people as children of God in a full and complete sense. They consider every person divine in origin, nature, and potential. Each has an eternal core and is a beloved spirit son or daughter of heavenly parents. Each possesses seeds, look at this, each possesses seeds of divinity and must choose whether to live in harmony or tension with that divinity. Through the atonement of Jesus Christ, key words, I mean, you know, we would go, oh, wow, great, they believe in the atonement. Through the atonement of Jesus Christ, all people may progress toward perfection and ultimately realize their divine destiny just as a child can develop the attributes of his or her parents over time. The divine nature that humans inherit can be developed to become like their heavenly fathers. And so there's this picture of progressive movement toward deity. Progressive movement toward deity. Um, this is you become a god. Um, prior to creation, many inhabited worlds and planets existed. Each has its own god, uh, or each has it which had various gods. Look at what Brigham Young says at the bottom of page 40. There never was a time when there were not gods and worlds and men were not passing through the same ordeals that we are passing through. That, of course, has been from all eternity, and that is and that will be to all eternity. So the first thing is that we see that they have this very, very different view concerning who God is, that God is a physical God, that Jesus is a physical God and remains in that way. Look at the top of page 41. And we're going to see a key issue here concerning creation. But a council of gods created our world out of eternal physical matter. Now, eternal physical matter. So they're saying that there was eternal substance that was there, and that's what the world was created from. That is fundamentally against Christian doctrine. One of the most important Christian doctrines that we believe that the, that the New Testament teaches very clearly is called the doctrine of creation ex nihilo. And ex nihilo means this, that we see in the Hebrew language that when God spoke and when he created, he created out of nothing. You say, well, how could he do that? I don't know. When we get to heaven, we can ask him. But that's part of the deal of this is a much bigger God than we can explain away. And so one of the key things is not only is he Trinity, Father, Son, and Spirit, perfect in one God in three persons, but he, he speaks and he creates ex nihilo. And so this is the nature of the true creator God. 
This is what they deny. They deny that God is this. Look at this. Look what Joseph Smith writes and put a big circle around this. God never made something out of nothing. That is a direct affront to one of the most basic truths in Scripture. That God does create from nothing. So, what about their view of Scripture and authority? You know, every belief system has some type of origin and authority by which they, they judge their beliefs. Um, in case if you haven't figured it out, this is the authority by which we base our beliefs. And this is what a little monk in Germany came along in the 1500s and said, hey, I think we need to go back to the way the early Christians believed because the early Christians, they based their beliefs upon the words of Christ and upon the Holy Scripture. That's it. And so 1,500 years later, Martin Luther comes along and he says, why do we believe in this guy with a nice pointy hat? And why do we believe in these guys with red capes? And why do we believe in all of these history stories for the last thousand years? Why are all these things our authority? When scripture alone is supposed to be our authority. Sola scriptura. Scripture alone becomes our authority. You see, when you start getting man involved in the process, you start messing stuff up. Because there's all these different motivations and all of these different issues. Well, here we see what is the authority of Mormonism. Let's see what they say. Here is our basis of authority for why we say what we say, why we believe what we believe. This is the, this is the issue. So there are four authoritative works. So they would say that there are four authoritative works that they depend upon. The first one is the Book of Mormon. The tagline of the Book of Mormon is called Another Testament of Jesus Christ. And here on my Book of Mormon, right here, you see on the front of my Book of Mormon, it says, what does it say right there? Another Testament of Jesus Christ. So this is saying, it's not just the New Testament of your Bible, but here is, here's another one. And this one came through um, Joseph Smith from an angel. So notice the next part here. So um, fill this in. Just kind of look as we go. Record of God's dealings with the inhabitants of ancient America from 2000 B.C. to 400 A.D. Many, so th this, is, this is going um, their pilgrimage from the Holy Land to America and then their time in America from about 600 um, on. So the idea is that there was this ancient civilization of Israelites in America. Um, and then many similarities to the King James Version of the Bible. If you read this, if you read the Book of Mormon, you would think that you're reading something from a King James New Testament. Is typically, it sounds like that. It is Elizabethan English, Elizabethan English um, vernacular. So it sounds just like the these and the vowels and um, everything else from that era. Um, so notice the next part here. That's, that's how he wrote it. Look at the next part. The Doctrine and the Covenants. That is another book that comes out of this that is authoritative for them. This is a collection of revelations and inspired declarations for the establishment and the regulation of the Church of Jesus Christ in the last days from 1830 to 1978. So that one was finished in 1978. There you go. Some of y'all were, I was 10 years old. So look at the next one. The Pearl of Great Price. Some of you have heard of that. This is the pearl, these are a selection of revelations, translations, and writings of Joseph Smith. And then we would see, they would say also the King James Version of the Bible, and only the King James Version of the Bible. Um, and then this, they would say, it is not inerrant. They would say that there are errors in the King James Version of the Bible in translation. Um, and I... I would say this, that the Bible in its original form was completely inerrant, infallible, and perfect in its delivery. Since then, through various translations, no translation is completely perfect. There's always different ways to do that. On essential areas within Christian doctrine, we would say, well, that's one of the reasons we want to be very careful with the translation we use. We want one that is as accurate as possible. 
And so, and I believe that we can rest very, very uh, assuredly in many of the translations, including the King James Version of the Bible, that it is a very reliable translation of the original perfect Greek and Hebrew um, that would have existed in the early days. But notice this, that they would say, no, there are errors in the translation, and they claim that there are certain errors that do have to do with critical doctrines, and that's where they really mess up. Notice this. We believe the Bible to be the Word of God as far as it was translated correctly. We also believe the Book of Mormon to be the Word of God. Articles of Faith 1.8, and that is found in the book, The Pearl of Great Price. So they would say that the Bible is not inerrant, and they would say that the Bible is not sufficient. In Nephi, um, chapter 29, Second Nephi chapter 29, look what it says, and this is Book of Mormon. Thou fool, that shall say a Bible, we have got a Bible, we need no more Bible. The idea here is that they're saying foolish is to say the Bible is enough. They're saying we got a Bible, we need no more Bible, we need more than the Bible. And friends, that is a grave mistake. You can read the last chapters of the New Testament and find out what a grave mistake that is. Notice this, footnoted to interpret um, meaning in alignment with the Latter-day Saints. So the, the Bible that they have has got footnotes all through it seeking to direct them toward LDS documents. Uh, excuse me, LDS doctrines. Look at the bottom of page 41. We also see the ongoing revelations. This is another part of their authority ongoing revelations in new interpretations. And here's the idea. The new interpretations and new revelations can supersede the previous ones um, from God. So these can only brought, be brought forward by a Mormon and the Mormon president. So here's the idea. The Mormon president at any time is free to go back and revise doctrinal beliefs um, if he senses that he needs to do that. And occasionally they do that. Look at page 42, top of the page. What do they believe about people and sin? So we've already said that they believe that men and women today are spirit sons and daughter of, daughters of God. So they, they make a big deal of your spirit sonship in this. Prior to creation, our spirits were children of heavenly parents. So these celestial parents um, out in the heavens, from, perhaps from other worlds. And then we left our heavenly home, took on human bodies, and are now being tested in order to progress to godhood. This is, this is a key issue. They're seeking to progress to godhood, becoming gods. And in our eternal nature, we are basically good, they would say, but in our earthly nature, we are prone to error. And so... In your spirit world, the, the spirit that came from another world that comes here to be in physical form, that is basically good, but in your earthly nature, you can have error. Jesus lived a sinless life so that we, his spirit brothers and sisters, could become gods like him and God the Father. Um, this, is, this is all the way right, right out there to the side, progression to Godhood, progression to Godhood. That's, they sincerely believe that it's about you ultimately becoming a God. Um, so interesting, uh, Satan's dialogue with Eve, um, when we really think about that. You ought to go back and read Genesis chapter 3. Look at the next part here. About Jesus, what do they believe about Jesus? And there's parts of it here that sound familiar but there's also parts here that sound unfamiliar and very strangely unfamiliar. But notice this in this paragraph that is here. Jesus was born to Mary at Bethlehem, lived a sinless life. We would say, good. He was born to, he, okay, let's just, let's do this a little bit. Jesus was born to Mary in Bethlehem. Mary, is that true? Yes. yes. At Bethlehem? Yes. Lived a sinless life? Everybody say yes, please. And made a perfect atonement for the sins, good right there, of all mankind by the shedding of blood. Of all mankind? No. Those who believe and trust in him. You say, well, what about, it says that he died for the sins of the world. Well, we can go and we can study that sometime. But we see that there is a very particular picture of what who is actually atoned for. 
giving his blood of his life on the cross. You see, so this sounds good, but there's already starting to be woven in misunderstanding. He rose from the dead. We agree with that. Thus assuring the eventual resurrection of all mankind. Well, in the sense that all mankind is is going to be resurrected to a judgment. That is true. Through Jesus' atonement and resurrection, those who repent of their sins and obey God's commands can live eternally with Jesus and the Father. See, there's parts of that that we would look at that and we would say, well, we agree with that. And that's why they would say that they're Christians. But here's the things that are strangely unfamiliar. Jesus is the firstborn spirit, they say, child, of the heavenly father and a heavenly mother. They would also say Jesus is a secondary God under God the father. Now, look at this. He did not possess deity in himself. Instead, Jesus progressed to deity in the spirit world. Now, friends, Two weeks ago, we looked at the councils in the first and second and third centuries. And the councils in the first and second and third centuries all carefully looked at what the scripture clearly said and said that, that those very issues are not true. Had Joseph Smith gone back and studied what Christian history says Christians carefully looked at and worked through, he would have understood, no, Jesus is God. And he was God from the start, from the beginning. And Jesus was was equal with the Father in his deity, but yet humbled himself to become a man for the purpose of dying on the cross for our sins. So there's things where they immediately begin to come and they become strangely unfamiliar. What about the next part here? About salvation. Jesus died on the cross and rose from the dead. We believe that through the atonement of Christ, all mankind may be saved by disobedience, by disobedience to the laws and ordinances of the gospel. Excuse, what did I say? Obedience. Sorry. <laughs> obedience to the laws and ordinances of the gospel. Now, see, there's a real problem here. Because we're not obedient to the laws and the ordinances of the gospel. You see, notice on the top of page 43... Not to endure the wrath due to our sin. They don't believe that. But to enable us to return to our original state as spiritual children of God. You see, their, their whole idea is that you came as a spirit from another world and you came here and your earthly flesh causes you to err, but Jesus can move you toward being a God. And as Jesus moves you toward being a God, you can be reunited with your perfect self from the other world. That's the idea, to return to your original state of being in a condition like God. Now, the conditions for salvation, put a square around the conditions for salvation. It's kind of hard to differentiate that a little bit on this, so put a big square around those words. I want you to see that's what this next part is about, is how can you be saved? How is it that you can be saved? Clearly, they say this. You are saved by grace, all caps, and effort. They say that you are saved by grace and effort, or by grace and works. Notice this um, that, they, that, that comes from Book of Mormon right here in their student manual. Look what it says. Grace cannot suffice without total effort on the part of the recipient. Hence the explanation, it is by grace that we are saved after all we can do. That is not what Ephesians chapter 2 says. Ephesians chapter 2, and put out there to the side, Ephesians chapter 2, 8 and 9, or 8 through 9, says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, that not of works. It is not of yourselves. So that no man can boast. It's only for by grace we have been saved through faith and that not of works. And so this is a direct contradiction. And by the way, this, and and here we are back here with religion and relationship. Many of you know this diagram that we use very often. The whole idea of religion and all the religions of the world, they center on works. What you're going to do to save yourself. Whereas in true Christianity, it's all about the the work of Christ. It is called grace-based 
salvation, not works-based salvation. It's the grace of God. It's, it, we could say it's God-based salvation. And so notice this, conditions of salvation, um, the picture of faith and repentance. Look at the next part that they would say. Baptism. And this includes the baptism of the dead. You can baptize someone who's already dead and it be efficacious towards salvation. Um, notice what this statement is on baptism and baptize from the LDS website. It says, because all of the earth, because all of the earth do not have the opportunity to accept the gospel during mortality, the Lord has authorized baptisms performed by proxy for the dead. Therefore, those who accept the gospel in the spirit world may qualify for entrance into God's kingdom. You see, the more you get into it, it starts just getting weirder and weirder and weirder. <laughs> and this is from the official website. Again, the LDS.org is not a 15-year-old. That is the official website. Look at the next part here. It's moral endurance. And the idea of moral endurance, they talk about moral endurance a lot. This is not consuming tobacco, alcohol, illegal narcotics, <laughs> coffee, or tea. You go to Starbucks, you go into hell. I mean, that, <laughs> that's the picture. Moral endurance. Um, I think we're all doomed, um, if that's the case. But, but I mean, no, really. Uh, the picture is uh, moral endurance. You know, we, you see, there's, there's Christian doctrines and there's Christian statements that we would look at at some of this and we would say, wait a minute, aren't Christians supposed to endure in their faith? Don't we believe in a doctrine called the perseverance of the saints? What is the perseverance of the saints versus the moral endurance? Well, there's a big difference in between those two things. But the picture is here that they are basing their salvation upon their works and their righteousness. And then these ordinances, the ordinances, um, the commands of baptism, confirmation, ordination to the priesthood for men, the temple endowment, and what is called the marriage sealing, or S-E-A-L-I-N-G, being sealed in marriage. All of this is straight from LDS.org, so the marriage sealing. Okay, so what, that's what they believe about salvation. There's, there's much that could be said about that in unpacking, but the bottom line is they believe in works-based salvation. That is, that's, that, that's the bracket that you could put on all of that. It is ultimately based not in the righteousness of Christ, in the work of Christ, but it's, still, it's ultimately in what you do in order to save yourself. Look at the bottom of page 43. What about judgment and eternity? They believe that everyone receives salvation. Um, so they would be universalist in that regard, resurrected, immortal, living in a heavenly kingdom. Once the body is reunited with the spirit, there are three potential destinations that await. And here's the first one. The first one is celestial glory. Now this is, gets really interesting. The highest level of celestial glory is, is reserved for married Mormons who have kept the celestial laws and commandments and participated in Mormon rituals. The lower level is for single Mormons. So singles are second-class citizens in this regard <laughs> who have lived worthy lives as well as good people, including Christians, people like you and me, they would say, who didn't have a chance on earth to hear and accept Mormonism. So eventually, we as Christians, what they believe is that they'll look at us and they'll kind of say, well, it would be best um, if you would come to Mormonism now and be married in the church, you'll be able to go to the highest heaven but if not, you'll still make it there. It'll just be in a lower level of heaven. Now, I'm not making this up. This is very clearly from the LDS website and their books of theology. What is interesting in is that in various other cults, we see some of these same tendencies, same doctrines. In Islam, even other religions. In Islam, there's different levels 
um, of heaven, and there's different levels of hell in this regard. In Catholicism, we see that. In various other groups, but very often in many other types of religions and in, in many cults, there is what we call universalism, that everybody eventually is saved. Um, and de the denial of true judgment. Notice the next part, the note here, that these people cannot become God. So the people that are in the lower level, um, you cannot become a God. So this is part of the reason you see a great emphasis on marriage um, within Mormonism. Obviously, if you want to become a God, you have to be married, and you have to be married in the Mormon church. What about terrestrial glory? Terrestrial glory, the word terrestrial means earthly, so earthly glory. This is unworthy Mormons and good people who knew about Mormonism on earth but rejected it until after death. And so then they, they go to terrestrial glory. Or telestial glory, this is wicked, wicked people who reject Mormonism even after death. And it's similar to Christian understanding of hell, but here's a key part, but not eternal. So they, that what they would say is that they believe in hell, but it's not an eternal hell. It is, they believe in something called annihilational, annihilationism, which means that the soul is eventually annihilated and does not go on in eternal judgment from God. Now, what is, what is kind of crystal clear here is that Mormons are not Christians. That becomes crystal clear. They're not depending on the death of Christ as their only hope for salvation, and they are not looking at the very clear picture that there is a holy God in heaven who, who calls us to look to him in faith and belief, and all who do that in casting themselves upon his grace and his mercy can be saved from their sins, and all who reject him and what he has done to forgive their sins will be cut off from him and separated from him. So they, they clearly do not believe that. Um, they deny foundational doctrines of biblical truth. Um, and it's truly, Joseph Smith truly had a warped view of Christianity. So if that's true, and if we look at this and we see this, we should have a great heart of compassion for them. We don't need to laugh at them. We need to mourn over these things. You know, part of the reason it seems absurd and we, we kind of find ourselves laughing a little bit is because maybe we have learned what the Scripture says. And we see the clarity of how good God is and how clear. Even as we study Hosea, we start to see, wow, this is a really hard truth. That God's, that God's work through his Isaiah, excuse me, Hosea, was so intense, but we see that his intensity is because he is a good and gracious God that calls us to trust in him, in him and not ourselves. How do we share the gospel with Mormons? How do we share with them? Number one, we demonstrate love to them. The most important thing is for you to love them, not to be annoyed with them, not to be batting them away like flies around your hamburger. I mean, I mean, you, when you, you know, we, we can become annoyed with them coming to the door or for them coming around us or seeing them in the propagation of things that we look at and we say, this is not true. But that's, that's not what we should do. We should not demonstrate anything but love to them. Look at the next part here. Our goal is not to win an argument with contempt. Um, arguing with Mormons is not usually um, something that is very profitable. Um, look at the next part here. Our goal is to care for a friend with compassion. That is what will win a Mormon to Christ, is to lovingly and carefully share with them the Scripture. In the middle of Matthew chapter 9 and verse 35, it said, notice that right in the middle of that paragraph, it says, when he saw the crowds, he had what? If anybody had reason to be annoyed with the crowds, it would be Jesus. They were constantly not believing, not understanding, and doing things that were just completely false and without faith. But Jesus didn't look at them with contempt. Jesus looked at them with compassion. And we too need to look at them with compassion. Notice the next part there after that, the compassion for them, because 
they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. You know, people that are in the bondage to falsehood, they are harassed by that. And they are, they are in bondage like sheep without a shepherd. And there's a lot, of, if we would begin to look at Mormons with compassion, thinking, golly, you've been sold a bill of goods. And you're running around trying to be a god. You're running around, this is, a, this is bondage. When God says, just come to me and I'll pour out grace upon you. Don't trust in yourself. Don't trust in anything else. Don't trust in your white shirt and your bicycle and your knowledge of, the, of a certain ancient document. He, what he's saying is, come to me and learn who I really am and trust in what I have done for you. And you can be out from underneath the bondage of good works that you'll never add up to. And you know, that's what Hosea is all about. Hosea is all about stop trusting in yourself and all of your failures. I mean, you're going to keep failing. Come throw yourself upon the scandalous love of God. And that's, that's the message that Mormons need to hear. That by grace, they can be saved simply through faith in Jesus and not faith in themselves. And so we need to have compassion for them. Look at the bottom of page 44. Imitate the life of Christ. As we imitate Jesus and show them who Jesus is, top of page 45, you see it. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. Look what it says. Therefore be what? Imitators of God. It doesn't say be God. It says be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in what? In love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. So we need to love them in this way. And you can do this with your family. As you, as you live out family life before them, you're showing them who Christ is. You can do this, look at down at the middle part here, in the church. It is right that we be the church. You know, um, our pastors and deacons and wives were together last night really praying for the church. And one of the things that we were praying for would be that we would, as a church would love each other so much that when people come into our midst, they see the way we're really acting toward one another in genuine love, and they go, wow, who is this? Why do they do that? I'm praying that there will be testimonies that people come to our church and they are converted because they see the Gruber family loving the Johnson family. Or they see um, the Neely family, or they see the Kessens really loving the others that are around them. And that they start to go, this is different. Um, so in the church, look what it says, John 13, 35. By all this, people will know you are my disciples if you have love for one another. That's Jesus speaking. What about this? We can see people come to Christ by explaining the gospel to them. They need it explained to them. We can't assume that they already know everything and they're, they're, they're steeped in it. There are a few of them that are good arguers. That is true. But the vast majority of them are not. Um, just understand that they need someone to patiently explain to them that we're not saved by our good works. And how do we do that? Top of page 46. We do that respectfully. So be respectful. Don't be disrespectful to them. Don't mock them and laugh at them and say, you want to be a god? And I mean, you know, they have these very, very sorted and strange traditions, many of them. One of them involves itchy underwear and other things that you look at and you go, what? And you start to, you start to look at that and you go, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Be respectful to them. Don't harass them. But be clear with them as well. Notice that. Be clear. And what do we need to be clear about? Here's what we need to be clear about. Top of page 46. Be clear about who God is and who we are. We need to be very clear about that. You see, God is the just and gracious circlet creator of the universe. He does create ex nihilo. He does create from nothing. And this is what makes him Holy. There is no other creator. What does the word holy mean? Right out there to the side. What does it mean? Set apart. That means different from the rest. So God is set apart. He's different from the rest. And the main thing that makes him set apart and different from the rest, which is what holy means, 
is that he's the creator. He's the only creator. So there's, there's nothing else um, that is like him in that. Look what it says in Isaiah 45, verses 5 through 6. And um, Ivan, would you mind reading Isaiah 45, verses 5 through 6? Read that real strong and real loud. I am the Lord and no other. They need to understand it. There's not thousands of gods. There is one God. And he is the Holy One of Israel. Notice the next one. Not only is he holy, but he is perfect. For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore you, O children of Jacob, are not consumed. You see, if the Lord changed, we wouldn't have any hope. But he doesn't change. If he changed, then he wouldn't keep his covenant with Abraham. And that's why when we look at Hosea chapter 1 like we did Sunday, and you remember he, he's talking about you are not my people, you will not have mercy, this is the people of Jezreel. I mean, all of these things that you've done because you deserve to be cut off from me. But then at the last, those last two verses in chapter 1, it is God, it's just God returning to his covenant with us saying you're going to be saved and you're going to be saved because of my love for you. That's the only reason you're going to be saved. Because of who I am, the fact that I keep my promise, I don't change. Notice this, he is holy, he is perfect, he is spirit. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. When were those words spoken? Jesus is looking at the woman at the well. And she is asking about her religion versus his religion. And Jesus looks at her and she's saying, should we go up on this mountain? Should we do this? Should we do that? And all of these things. And Jesus is looking at him saying, you keep asking about what all you're going to do and where to go and all of that. And Jesus is saying, you worship God in spirit. The real worship is from the heart, not from the hands. Now, the work of the hands comes from the heart if it's going right. But here Jesus is saying, I, I am a spirit, and you worship me in spirit. Look at the next part. He is eternal. Um, he, he is from the beginning and from the start. He has always been. Bottom of the page. We are creatures who are totally dependent upon him. What is a creature? What is the idea of that? Yeah, we, we, a creature has been created. And a creature is created by who? The creator. You, you're, get, you're starting to get my drift. So the creator creates creatures. And so he is the creator and we are the creatures. And that's what a Mormon needs to start to understand. Um, look at the next part on top of page 47. We are not morally neutral. They would say you are morally neutral. And you're neutral because you came into this world as a spirit god and your earthly part messes that up and makes errors, but so that makes you morally neutral. Um, but that's not what Ephesians 1 and 2 says, or chapter 2, verses 1 through 3 says. And you were dead in the trespasses of your sins in which you were once walked. So underline that word dead. You were dead. This is talking, Paul is writing to Christians. For following the course of the world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is, not at work in the, that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. He's saying, you once were those things. But you know, the next verse says, but God, being rich in mercy, came and rescues us. So, we're not morally neutral, and we are all ultimately guilty. They need to know that. That we are ultimately guilty before God. Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, the death and death through sin, and so death, underline it, spread to all men because all sinned. Mormons will admit to you that they have sinned. They just don't realize that that sin makes them truly guilty before God, needing total forgiveness that can only come through the grace 
of the cross. Notice the next statement that is here. We not only need to share with them carefully those things, but we need to be clear about who Jesus is and what Jesus has done. This is where they're really confused, and they need to know who Jesus is. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5 says this, For there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. They need to understand that Christ is the perfect God-man who brings God and man together. So this is Christ in the flesh, the one who would bring together God and man, and he does it in his own body. This is who he is. So this is what they need to hear about that. Here's what they need to hear. Look what it says. He is fully God and fully man, eternal in nature and equal with God. They need to understand that, that Jesus wasn't a child of God that was created by God, that was not in existence and then came into existence. They need to understand that Jesus is in the Godhead, fully God and fully man, eternal in nature and equal with God. And we see this in John. These are great verses to share with them. John chapter 1 and verses 1 through 3. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Underline that. The Word was God. This is Jesus. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. You see, Jesus is the creator. All things were made through him. And without him was not anything made that was made. Very clear. It goes back and repeats it. Look at John 1, verse 14. And the word, so, so this is Jesus, um, second person of the Trinity, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Look at the next one. Jesus is speaking to uh, the people that are around him, and he says in John 10, verse 30, I and the Father are one. They, Mormons need to see that. I and the Father are one. We are not separated. We are not different gods. Secondly, they need to see this. He died on the cross to pay for our sins. He didn't die on the cross as a nice gesture. He died on the cross to pay for our sins. And this is the only way that we can be saved from our sins by him paying for them. Otherwise, we go into eternity with sins that are not paid. Look at verse four, or page 48. We do need to communicate with them graciously. We are saved graciously. We are saved by God's grace. Look what it says here. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Um, that's chapter 2, verse 8, and I love chapter 2, verse 9, where it just underscores it is not by works. So we are saved by grace, not by our works. That's what they need to hear. We are saved through faith, not through our effort. That's what they need to see, that it's not by their efforts. And we come to the Lord humbly, and we see that he works in our hearts and humbly brings us to him. You see, it's not about you being a proud God. That's, what, that's, that's this whole section right here under humbly. The idea is you're not going to be God. You see, the desire to be God is a proud thing. That's a very prideful thing. That's what got us into this mess in the first place. As Adam and Eve were disobeying God, wanting to be like God, wanting to be a God, notice this, that that causes us to desperately need the salvation that comes in Christ. So our goal, top of page 49, our goal is not equality with God. They need to see that. But the picture is our reconciliation with God. Our goal is reconciliation with God, not equality with God. You know, Jeremiah 9 describes to us the great hope is that we would come to know the Lord. And they definitely need to see this. Circle the word urgently. They need to hear this. They need to hear it now. They need to see it now. They need to hear the God of grace that is for them. Everyone will be resurrected, but not necessarily to salvation. John chapter 5, verse 25 through 29 makes clear that some are going to be re resurrected unto condemnation. That's very serious. 
You see, they can't go into eternity kind of thinking, well, if we're wrong, how bad can it be? Well, I mean, we've lived a good life. Certainly, I mean, we're better than most Baptists. We don't drink coffee or tea or, you know, all these other things. I mean, you know, everybody says hire a Mormon if you really want a nice, clean guy to get the thing done or whatever. I mean, but the picture is this. If you're wrong, you're not going to be resurrected to salvation. You're going to be resurrected to judgment. Bottom of page 49. There are no second chances after death. You see, that's kind of in the back of their mind. Well, if I'm wrong, it's all going to work out in the end. No, they need to understand that that's not what the scripture says. Look what Hebrews 9.27 says at the bottom. It says, and just as an appointed for man wants to die, and after that comes judgment. Top of page 50, and we're closing here. Believe in the power of Christ. That's what they need to believe in. And we have to trust that the power of Christ is what is going to save them. But their only hope for them is, as the, just like the only hope for us is to believe in Christ. You see, there is salva- Acts 4.12 says, there is salvation in no one else. There is no other name under, which heaven, uh, under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. It is through Jesus. And how do we come to this? We trust in his word completely. We come to see that his word is the only authority, not revelations from an angel that were deciphered through crystals, not in various other covenants and doctrines and councils and prophets and presidents of a denomination. It's only by the word of God. And we need to see that God's word is reliable, it's inspired, and it's inerrant. Look what 2 Timothy 3.16 says. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. We have to come to the place of trusting in God's word. And that very often is one of the great life gate issues that helps us to see the gospel, that God speaks and his word is true. Look at the last two here. We need to trust that the Bible is not only inspiring and errant, but it is supreme and is sufficient. They don't need a counsel. They don't need another book. They don't need another vision. They don't need another revelation. What they need to do is trust in the Word. You remember our favorite little book of Jude about apostasy? Look what it says here. Look at Jude, and this is verse 3. Beloved, Although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. Friends, you just stick with the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. You're safe there. Don't go with something new. And they need to be told that. When I speak with uh, Mormons, I will often say to them, Do you know the history? Do you know where this started? Do you know how new it is? And you start talking about 1830? It's 1830. I mean, that was just a short time ago. I mean, you start talking about new beliefs in one person. Say, do you you really trust that? Do you really trust what he said? Do you really trust the different? I mean, because there was a lot of other people who say, that's actually not what happened that were from that time period. I I begin to say, why are you trusting in something else besides the Word of God that has been truly protected? Look at the last part here. We pray to Him continually. If we want to see our Mormon friends come to faith, we need to pray to God that they would come and see. Look what it says in Romans 10.1. Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they be saved. Don't think that you're going to go just reveal to them everything because you heard it at Secret Church. I mean, I I do encourage you to engage Muslims. I encourage you to study this. I encourage you to have a conversation with them. I really do. Share the gospel with them. But pray as you do because the Lord is the only one that can truly deliver them. Okay, we made it through another Secret Church. I'm proud of y'all. About 17 pages of good information, hopefully watering in the gospel in your heart, and hopefully helping inoculate you from false doctrines. Watch out for the new stuff. The new stuff isn't that good, but the old stuff is glorious. Amen?